I don't know where we are heading. Uh, I think with the number of talks and everything, uh, Venkat, you will have to start on time. <laughs> on time, yeah. We have another two minutes to go. We have more than 40 people already. So, I yeah. think... Uh, yeah. <clears throat> How many are we ready to start at for 12? 12, yes. Yes, sir. We are ready, sir. Dr. San I'm just waiting for Dr. Sandeep, sir. Yeah. So, Sandeep is there. No, he came now, he is not there. Is it? Yes, check his slides also, no? He he will come for his talk. Don't worry. No, sir. <laughs> so, can I uh, put my slides now? We have just a minute to go. Yes, sir. Please. Can you see my... Yes, yes. sir. Yes. <coughs> Think of that bar I need to remove. <laughs> Your Pujari, sir, you all are going to a hospital? It's 12 o'clock. I am going twice a week, yes. Okay. I am going only in the morning, uh, OPD and uh, attending yeah. emergencies only. Oh. We are actually, we are seven consultants. So we have divided uh, in 15 days, we go for three days. It is like that. Okay. Every two weeks, we go for three times. So, sir, in a Bombay hospital also, they have COVID wards and all, or it's not yet? Uh, and you show you something. Have, you have seen our place. We have three wings. One is the yeah. oldest wing. One is something which was built in 70s and one which has been built this uh, millennium. So, uh, the one which is built in 70s, that whole wing, uh, more than uh, uh, 15 plus uh, 24. So, 39 ICU beds and about 50 uh, isolation beds are available. So, I think it's 12. Dr. Deo Pujara, I think it's 12. Yeah. Yeah. So, Namrit, I think we, we are ready to go, no? Yes. Sir. Yeah. So, we'll start off. So, good morning, everyone. So, welcome to the, welcome to the NSI webinar on tethered card syndrome. We have a galaxy of uh, speakers who are very well experienced in this area is going to deliberate on this uh, interesting topic. Nevertheless, in this short time, we will not be able to complete the entire topic of the tethered card syndrome. We will try to give the highlight the principles and the management details. Uh, tethered card has been defined as stretch induced functional disorder of the spinal cord with its uh, caudal part anchored by an inelastic structure. That's the definition. However, we want to make a comprehensive understanding of the tethered cord. The definition like progressive, neurological, urological, and, and orthopedic symptoms due to restraint of spinal cord movement and traction resulting from either anatomical, physiological, or pathological factors. That will cover the entire uh, uh, gamut of the problem associated with the tethered cord. Now, we look at the tethered cord, it represents an individual diagnosis, yet it is a combination of signs and symptoms mm -hmm. associated with various forms of spinal dysraphism. Now, if you look back, the history of spinal dysraphism goes back to 10,000 BC, but the important point we need to highlight is that the spina bifida occulta has been first described by <coughs> Rudolf Verko and uh, the possibility of tethered cord as well. Later on, Von Recklinghausen in 1833 to 1910 described not only occulta, his association with hypertrichosis, and he's the first one to write about tethering and traction of the spinal cord that is possible in this syndrome. Later on, Garcio, who is an orthopedic surgeon, he has described spinal and bony deformities, and the spinal cord uh, tightness is responsible for these bony anomalies, and he called it as that 
uh, traction, uh, cord traction syndrome. And later on, urinary, cutaneous, and orthopedic and skeletal abnormalities became very prominent in 20th century. And uh, Lichtenstein is 1942 first described the association of low lying spinal cord and possibility of traction due to fixation of the spinal cord. Later on, the popular three H's, they're known as Hoffman, Hendrick, and Humphreys, began the new era of the tether cord syndrome from the 20th century, giving us all the modern concepts that we are talking about. Essentially, the tether cord is associated with two types of syndromes. One is a spina bifida manifesta, and the other one is a spina bifida occulta. And in all the groups, one key thing is the phylum terminal. Uh, that is the one, the entire thing which revolves around. So in the 12th century, the phylum terminal has been defined as the nervous impar. Okay, and then Parker and McConnell is the one who described the shortened phylum terminal is the cause of the tethered cord syndrome. And the Gasso in 1953 first said that is a tight phylum terminal is the cause of the tethered syndrome. Now, uh, if you look at the em embryology, in the day 52, there is a caudal neural tube regression that is responsible for the conus as well as the formation of the future phylum uh, terminal. And uh, the errors in the canalization of the tail bud is the one which is responsible for all these abnormalities that can happen with the development of the phylum. Now, if you look at the phylum, it uh, extends from the apex of the conus medullaris to the dorsum of the coccyx. The total length of it can be 20 centimeters. The normal thickness of the phylum is about two millimeters and it can reach as, uh, as the caudal border of the second uh, sacral vertebra. Now, the phylum has been divided as the phylum terminal internum, which is about 15 centimeters continuous with the dura and arachnoid is, uh, has got the cover of the pia, whereas the externum, which is adherent to the dura, which is about five centimeters. Now, there are many variations described in the phylum terminal. Uh, some, one of them are the, due to the position, uh, fatty infiltration, duplication, particularly in the split cord malformations, variations in the length, variations in structure and the composition, and the terminal ventricle. Now, the normal, Composition of the phylum terminal consists of ependymal cells, neuroblasts, corpora amylacea, and elastic tissue. And the fibroelastic tissue is something which is quite variable in different situations, making the phylum thick as well as inelastic in the pathological uh, situations. Now, embryology was uh, controversial earlier. The original concept was that the traction in the tethered cord is only by the phylum terminal. Now we know that it has been expanded as a syndrome that uh, wherever the cord is tethered, it by any kind of a structure that can cause a tethered cord syndrome. And predominantly in addition, there can be a, a restraint by the inelastic structure that is a phylum terminal. Now, we, there is no confusion now that the adult level uh, will be reached right at the birth by the ex, uh, various studies by Putini as well as the Streeter. And there were comprehensive embryological studies have proved beyond doubt now. Now, if you look at that, uh, the tethered cord can be classified as the anatomical, where the, the conus itself is placed low, or it could be physiological, where the conus remains normal, but is associated with the, the thick phylum or fatty phylum, or a structural variance like inelastic and a increased fibrous component, which make the uh, phylum behave differently, not allowing the spinal cord to move. And there can be a developmental associated with congenital anomalies of the spine, lipomyelomeningocils, split cord malformations, LDM, dermal sinus, myelomeningocils, and as well as the sacral agenesis. Now, the, uh, the, in addition to that, there is a new entity is a post-operative tethered cord, where after the surgery, because of the scarring, uh, there can be retethering resulting in the similar syndrome. Now, the mechanism of the tethering uh, could be due to the body growth, as the spinal cord, the spinal column is growing, the spinal cord doesn't grow along with that proportionately, resulting in traction syndrome. Or uh, every movement of the body, the flexion and extension movement, uh, the cord is supposed to move two segments up and down. And when there is a restraint by the denticulate ligament, it can cause a repeated uh, traction. And it is a, a certain amount of traction is associated with the cough, regular physical strain, including the heartbeat, has been described. Now, when you look at the mechanisms of the tethering cord, there are several experiments that have been done in the past. Now, the proposed mechanisms is a, a simple mechanical stretch, which is a recurrent, resulting in the uh, damage of the spinal cord, which is uh, uh, slowly starts from the lower end and then gradually ascends up. 
which that is because of the fixed cord as uh, the spinal cord is fixed at the uh, cervical level and the D12 level of the denticulate ligaments and uh, anything uh, the video tightness can cause traction on that. Now the second thing is that because of this uh, recurrent episodes of there is a disturbance in the oxidative metabolism resulting in energy failure and leading to uh, tethered cord syndrome and progressive neurological deficit. In addition to that, spinal cord has blood supply, which has got a circular vessels as well as radiant vessels. Whenever there is a traction, the radiant vessels which go from periphery to the center gets occluded repeatedly, resulting in a recurrent ischemic insult, resulting in progressive neurological deficit. And last but not the least, a tethered cord syndrome because of the variety of associated anomalies can also have an associated dysgenesis of the neural structures itself, which can produce a, which is more or less a static and permanent uh, neurological deficit. And this is the one to be recognized importantly, that is unlikely to recover even after uh, removal of the uh, tethered uh, effect. But the benefit that we get after untethering is that there is no further progression. And that is something which can be protected by taking care of these children. Now, the tethered cord syndrome is predominantly seen in children and rarely it can present in adults as well. Therefore, it can come to neurontologists, pediatricians, orthopedics, urologists, and finally, neurosurgeons. Uh, though prenatal screening is becoming popular, still there are difficulties because tethered cord syndrome can have a variety of presentations like neurological, urorectal, and most important hallmark where one need to be uh, aware of and need to create awareness among all the pediatricians is the cutaneous markers where they can be identified, picked early and investigated so that we can uh, 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 identify and treat them. Now, craniospinal imaging has become the standard of the day to day. And uh, uh, I think each of these pathologies uh, and variety of pathologies that are associated with that will be dealt by different speakers. However, the point to remember is that the conus is at L1 lower border, that's adult level at birth, and that is considered as the normal. Any conus below L2 is considered a suspect tethering. And postoperatively, very important thing to remember in MRI is that the spinal cord is not going to ascend and it is going to remain there. All that what we are doing is a good untethering is that you're making the cord lax and move with the movements of the body. So this has to be remembered because radiologists quite often <coughs> report that cord still tethered at the lower level. So it's important point to remember that cord will not ascend after the surgery. Now, uh, the evolution of the tethered cord, if you look at, there are uh, uh, many things that have happened over the last uh, two decades. There is increase in the awareness, especially in the spina bifida occulta and the tethered cord association. The indications have gradually expanded and understanding of the embryology has become better and better. The imaging has become a standard as the craniospinal MRIs and natural course is known in good majority of the conditions. We understand now the pathophysiology of the tethering and microsurgery has become very popular as and complete untethering is being possible in good uh, number of uh, situations. Intraoperative electrophysiology is uh, really helpful and there are supportive therapies which have made these children better and better and follow up and we also know the phenomenon of retethering and therefore the significance of the follow up of these children for a long time, despite a very good surgery. Yet, there are many controversies that remain today, whether to operate or to observe. And if you decide to operate, it should be either prophylactic surgery or asymptomatic surgery alone, or retethering. Uh, how do we identify it and when do we operate? How aggressive one should be? And cutting the phylum in other than uh, uh, a simple low-lying conus with uh, other pathologies, is it necessary in addition to the dealing with the pathology or not? A condition called non-neurogenic neurogenic bladder itself is controversial. It's also known as occult tethered cord syndrome. And uh, how to deal with these situations, particularly in complex anomalies and the phenomenon of retethering itself has many issues to be discussed. So I will leave the forum at this point and then ask other speakers to uh, talk about individual situations. And then finally, we'll take the uh, questions and discuss. Now I uh, request Dr. Sandeep Chatterjee to speak about lipomyelomeningocils and tethering. Thank you.
Okay, you can see my screen, Venkat? Yes, Sandeep, please go ahead. Okay, so I'm going to briefly talk about lipomas in children. And very quickly, in about 12 or 13 minutes, cover their origin, presentation, investigation, certain decisions regarding treatment. Very quickly allude to the techniques of surgery and talk about complications and follow up. So if you remember the stages of spinal cord development, there are three stages, gastrulation, which fundamentally involves forming a three-layered embryonic disc, neurulation, where the neural tube closes, and disjunction, where the neuroectoderm separates from the cutaneous ectoderm. As far as lipomas are concerned, this is the one we're particularly interested with. And this is fundamentally what happens if C is the cutaneous ectoderm, N is the neural tube, that's your neural groove. And as development proceeds, the neural tube forms, and then finally, the neural tube separates from the cutaneous ectoderm. That's called disjunction, the separation. If now we have a situation where you have the neural tube, and, and of course, what happens is in between, you have this mesoderm, which comes in between the cutaneous ectoderm and the neuroectoderm. Now, what happens if you have disjunction occurring too early? In other words, the neural tube separates before it closes. So there is your cutaneous ectoderm, neuroectoderm, which is still open because the neural tube hasn't closed. The mesoderm travels in to that gap. And you now have a situation where you have a cutaneous ectoderm, neuroectoderm, separated by mesoderm, but that mesoderm has sat like the ice cream or an ice cream cone over the open neural tube defect. And that's what you get. And that's what's called a lipoma. So fundamentally, a lipoma is this. You have cutaneous ectoderm, you have mesoderm, and you have an open neural tube with neuroectoderm. Quite understandably, you have a separation plane between the neuroectoderm here and the mesoderm there. And that's the famous white line of the lipoma. When, as a pediatric neurosurgeon, we look at a lipoma, we look at the lipoma like this, and we think that's cutaneous ectoderm, there's neuroectoderm, there's a neural tube, which is separated with a lot of mesoderm that has moved in because the neural tubes open between that cutaneous ectoderm there and the neuroectoderm forming the neural tube there. So whereas you look at this lump in the skin, we look upon it and say, why? Well, this is what it is, cutaneous ectoderm, mesoderm, which forms a lipoma and the neural tube. So if you try and work out how this lipoma presents, it presents with the skin which is intact. This is completely in contrast to the open neural tube defects. The mesoderm produces a lump. It can be firm, it can be soft, it can be but it's never cystic because it's mesoderm, it's not filled with fluid. And because you have the neuroectoderm below, which is an open neural tube, you can get neurodeficit. So three things, an intact skin, a soft lump in the midline and neurodeficit. This is what they look like, a midline swelling in the back, which is present since birth, doesn't increase on crying, gradually increases in size, very rarely pain, but you have to look very carefully to see if there are associated sinuses. This is a child who has an associated small little sinus there. This one is innocuous because it is below the third sacral vertebra. What about the neurological status? To my mind, lipomas present with three different neurological scenarios. Either they have no neurodeficit or they have a fixed deficit from birth. For example, a foot drop, which is there right from birth. Or they have progressive deficit. So as the child grows bigger, the foot drop becomes a weakness of the leg and may later on lead to a sphincteric problem. This is of importance because when we treat these children, we want to know whether they leave the hospital like this or like this. And the determinant is when we operate on them. What investigations would you do for any tethered cord? I think it's a good idea to get a whole spine uh, film x-ray an MRI, again, of the whole spine, very important in a lipoma is to work out the relationship of that lipoma to the conus and to identify connecting strands, also to look at the level at which the conus is. And of course, the axial cut helps to identify this abnormal uh, mesenchyme. I like the coronal cut quite often because it shows me the asymmetry of the conus. 
CT is not that important. In, this is done because this is an older child, but with smaller children, we generally would avoid it. Brain imaging is mandatory because these children would have problems with the brain, hydrocephalus, developmental issues, and this needs to be looked at before you embark on surgery for the lipoma. Right, what are the types of lipoma? Fundamentally, lipomas are of two types. Lipomas of the phylum, shown here. So here is a, the, the fat in the phylum. All you do is chop this off, and that's all that needs to be done. So liposomas of the phylum, if you need to operate on them, the treatment is to simply chop off that lipoma or cut the phylum. And this is an operation that can be done uh, even by hospital security guards. Much, much more difficult is the second category of lipomas, which we call the lipomas of the conus. What is a lipoma of the conus? A well, lipoma of the conus is, of, again, being classified depending on the attachment of the lipoma to the conus. So if this is a lipoma attached to the conus, and you can see this attached to the dorsal aspect of the conus, this is a the diagram I borrowed from Professor Ale Piekans in his original classification. And you can see the lipoma is on the dorsal aspect. That's the conus, that's the lipoma. This is called a dorsal lipoma. If the lipoma is inferior to the conus, so the conus ends and the lipoma begins, it looks like this. And of course, it's called a terminal lipoma. On the other hand, if you have a lipoma, which is partly dorsal and partly terminal, then this is called a transitional lipoma. And very much recently, Professor Pang described a fourth type of lipoma, and this is a slide uh, from Professor Pang and from his publication where the lipoma goes ventral to the cord. Professor Pang called these chaotic lipomas. So you have lipomas of the phylum and lipomas of the conus, and lipomas of the conus can be dorsal, they can be terminal, they can be transitional, or they can be chaotic. Okay, how would you treat? Very easy, go back to the neurodeficit. If they have no neurodeficit question, should you operate? And we'll come back to this in a minute because this is one of the raging controversies of pediatric neurosurgery. If they have a fixed deficit, question, will intervention help? And the answer is possibly it will not make a difference. If they have progressive neurological deficit, there is no question they need early neurological, neurosurgical intervention. Right. With the asymptomatic lipomas, there's been an age-old controversy, and there's been what I call the Chicago versus Paris dialogue. And this is a Chicago versus Paris argument occurring in the city of Calcutta. There is Paris represented by Professor Michel Gerard. Chicago, of course, are represented here by Professor Dakling Bang. And you can see I'm somewhere in the middle on that photograph. Uh, and they're uh, fighting over what drink they will order for dinner. But in fact, the reality is that they've been fighting for many years over whether one should operate on asymptomatic lipomas. And the argument from Paris was that if you have to operate and, pro and provide uh, surgery for an asymptomatic lesion, you must prove that the surgery provides no neurodeficit or is not likely to produce a neurodeficit. It must prevent, in fact, further development of neurodeficit. It must be further established that if you wait, then this waiting to intervene causes further increasing signs, more tethering, and more deficit. Unfortunately, most of the meta-analysis recorded neurological deterioration after surgery in asymptomatic lipomas that varies immensely from 4% to 16%. And that's why this was the argument from Paris. And this is, again, a slide from Professor Ale Pierkan's original publication. If you have 4% of these children having neurological deficit, and if you can establish that, in fact, the, the asymptomatic lipomas uh, do not produce that much of neurological deficit, if you do not operate on them, then the argument for surgery is very weak. Besides, they showed that 100% of these kids that they operated on the lipoma gets retethered. So that was the argument, no point doing uh, surgery for asymptomatic lipomas. And this was really overturned by this publication from Professor Pang, who showed that if you did total resection, then your chance of having a good outcome in 10 or even 15 years was much better than his own series where he did a partial removal. Thus pointing out that really the difference was 
that you could operate on asymptomatic lipomas provided you remove the lipoma completely. And this is what he said. He said total resection has a better long-term outcome than no surgery. But of course, added that partial resection has a worse outcome in no surgery and should not be done. I think now after the raging debate for many years, we've, we've really settled down to accept that for dorsal and terminal lipomas, total removal is possible with minimal deficit, particularly if you use intraoperative neuromonitoring. In the, trend, in the chaotic lipomas, surgery is difficult and asymptomatic chaotic lipomas are definitely best left alone. For the transitional lipoma, there is still a controversy. Should you do it, should you not? What's my take on that? I would say you should operate on a transitional lipoma, depending on the experience of the neurosurgeon, the availability of intraoperative monitoring and parental expectations. So how do you operate on a lipoma? This is what we do. We use a U-shaped flap because this flap gets your incision far away from the inus. And then the fundamental uh, trick is to expose as widely as possible, wide laminectomy. Because you remember the lipoma is like that, an ice cream cone. This is a photograph borrowed from Professor Peng. And it's very important that you do a very, very wide laminectomy. Second, expose the dura proximally, distally, and all around the lipoma. And very importantly, work around the lipoma. And finally, so you work right around it. This is a technique that we use to work around the lipoma. Debulk the lipoma, make it a manageable size, and fundamentally then get a pyre to pyre closure. This is called neuralation. And once you've got that pyre closed, you can put that lipoma back. And final procedure that we do is chop off the phylum terminal. Complications, the worst is CSF leak, neurodeficit we have in 6% in our series and 5% have clinical retethering. Follow-up, of course, has to be neurological, urological, orthopedic, and of course, you have to monitor for retethering. And finally, if I just have one or two minutes, I'll just take you through how we would operate on these lipomas. That's the proximal, we expose the proximal dura, we expose the distal dura, then we open the dura and we put these stitches on the dura and then we work round the lipoma, expose the dura all around. You can see we're working on one side laterally from cranial to caudal. And then again, that's the caudal dura there. And we have again uh, exposed completely all around. There's your lipoma. You have the distal part there, the proximal dura there, and we are separating out the last bit of the lateral dura on each side. So here you have the conus, here you have the lipoma sitting on the conus, and of course then you can start debulking the lipoma. Uh, in our practice, we do debulk the lipoma very, very aggressively, right down to the so-called white line. You can see how little the lipoma is left. We simply have the conus left here at this stage, and once you reach that stage with minimal left, here we are dividing the phylum terminale. We're just stimulating it to check that. Uh, and then we divide the phylum terminale. And finally, we neuralate completely. So that's, that's dividing the phylum. That's an important step if you want to untether that completely. And then finally, we just do a neuralation. So I'm going to stop here. Uh, and then um, I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Sandeep, uh, for finishing on time. Now we'll move on to Dr. Deepak Gupta. All right. I'm just sharing my screen. Yeah. Yeah, Deepak, can you? Yeah, yeah, I'm doing that. Is my screen visible? No. 
Ah, no, not yet. Can you have the another speaker and then I can join back? I don't know why. I'm not. One second. Share screen. Just do the share screen. I'm doing. Uh, then do the share and then open your presentation. Yeah. The presentation is on the desktop. Yes, apparently, I'm not the host. It's only host can share the screen, is it? No, no. You can. Lamini, are you there? Lamini. He is the host, sir. Co host. Ah, so. You can, can share, sir. Yes, yes. I think maybe we can have the next speaker and in the meanwhile, I'll get it sorted out. Yeah, fine. Uh, uh, Dr. Muthukumar, are you ready? Professor Muthukumar? Yeah, I am coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It says the other person should stop. Yes. We are yeah, seeing you, you, Deepak. Deepak, you have to, yeah, yeah, fine. That's fine. Are you able to see, see my slides? Yes, yes, yes. Go ahead. Okay. So, in this presentation, we'll be talking about limited dorsal myelaskisis. And uh, before going into the topic proper, uh, most people are under the impression that this is a newly discovered entity. I want to assure them that this is not a newly discovered entity. Almost 30 years ago, way back in 1991, Paul Steinberg and Douglas Cochrane in JNS published that certain meningocils can have stalk-like structures passing from the cord inside the meningocil. And subsequently in 2006, Andrea Rossi from Genova, Italy, we termed them as non-terminal myelocyster cells. We used the term, term non-terminal myelocyster cells in our 2007 publication in JNS, which also elicited an editorial with a cover, cover picture. So in 2010, and the Dr. Pang uh, renamed these lesions as uh, LDMs, and he proposed an embryological theory on the basis of which he christened this uh, entity. It is characterized by two features, a cutaneous lesion and the physical connection between the cutaneous lesion and the underlying spinal cord. So, no talk on, on the on a congenital malformation will be complete without the embryogenesis. The embryogenesis of LDM is almost similar to that of spinal dermal sinus in that there's an incomplete dissection between the cutaneous ectoderm and the neuroectoderm, which results in the formation of a persistent physical connection, which forms the tethering element. So this is the, on the left side, you see the normal development where the cutaneous, the neuroectoderm sinks into the developing embryo after separation. On the right side, this is an incomplete disjunction, which can result in two types of LDMs. What happens is, Dan has not named it as type one. I call it as type one because in the, the so-called type one, there's a physical connection between the cutaneous lesion on the spinal cord, but there is no CSF in this particular uh, type. Whereas in the second type, there is a subcutaneous meningocele. And the subcutaneous meningocele now communicates through the stalk with the syrinx in the spinal cord. We'll see clinical and radiological examples of both types later in the discussion. Now, the, the, the cutaneous lesions have been classified into four types by PANG, sacular, crater, pit, and membranous. I believe this is uh, really hair splitting. I, for some, I believe it is sufficient to classify them into sacular and non-sacular. And uh, when you come to the neurological deficit, the incidence of neurological deficits in PANG series is close to 40 to 50 percent. And in my personal series of a little over 60 LDMs, the incidence is much lesser, close to around 30 percent only. And in PANG series, uh, the incidence of associated lesions al along with the LDMs, like as a associated lesions were there in 70% of the cases. So in those patients, it is very difficult to say whether the neurological deficit is due to the LDM or due to the associated lesion. Now let's come to the radiology. Radiology is the key to diagnosis. Radiology will show a fibroneural star that connects the cutaneous lesion to the star, to the spinal cord. Less commonly in one variety, the type two variety, you can see a CSF space within this stalk. 
and it's extremely important some of some time in the axial image maybe sometimes even the sagittal image we may not be able to see the connection between the cutaneous um, the lesion and the cord because of the oblique nature of the stalk now the most important feature we have to keep in mind for diagnosing this lesion is the posterior tenting of the cord at the site of the lesion i'll show you several examples of this and i would like all of you to remember that these lesions can occur in cervical thoracic and lumbar regions but when they occur in the lumbar regions we have to make sure that the, we have to remember there are two ther tethering lesions this one tethering lesion is the ldm second the te tethering lesion is the tight phylum unless we deal with both our untethering will be incomplete now coming to the associated lesions in pang series the the most common was thickened phylum so was in our series in our particular uh, series the most uh, second most common was uh, split cord malformation followed by dermoid and filar lipoma and there was only one patient with associated arachnoid cyst so they what is the aim of surgery the aim of surgery is to untether the cord we have to section this ldm stock close to the cord and if there are associated lesions that which may or may not be seen in pre operative imaging then that those lesions should also be uh, dealt with appropriately this is an example of a sacular type of ldm which in the opd i diagnosed as a because the child had no neurological deficit as a meningocele and however when you see look at the uh, mri sagittal image shows there's a stalk that goes inside the meningocele sac and there's a syrinx that is seen both intraspinally as well as in the extraspinally and you are able to see this 3d cis image which shows the intraspinal hydromyelia and the extraspinal hydromyelia and the axial image which shows the country country the stalk with the the csf collection inside that's the intro of the photograph which shows the stalk adherent to the dome of the sac and that is after untethering this is an another example where the child had a cervical sacular ldm there a child there was a pan ventricular hydrocephalus where the fourth ventricle was communicating with the cervical syrinx which in turn was communicating with the the, the, the meningocele through the sac through the stalk now let's come to the embryological and radiological correlation we said we talked about type 2 and this is exactly this radiology image correlates with what has been seen in embryology this is the subcutaneous meningocele the yellow arrow points to the csf containing stalk the green arrow points to the syrinx in the cord now this is the intraoperative image sequential intraoperative image images from intraoperatively here you see the grossly thickened stalk going inside going outside it is almost as thick as the cord and you can see the desmin section and this opening in the syringocele is very clearly seen another example please note there is both not only both intraspinal and extraspinal hydromyelia the key is the identification of the posterior tenting of the cord that is the key to the diagnosis and this is another example once again notice the posterior tenting of the cord is seen and there is both intraspinal and extraspinal hydromyelia and this is one year post op you see the posterior tenting of the cord has gone away this lesion was once again misdiagnosed as a cervical meningocele but why it is not a cervical meningocele just look at this look at this sagittal image there's a posterior tenting of the cord now we go to the axial t2 you see within the sac there's a negative shadow produced by this stalk which means this, this is an ldm and not a simple uh, meningocele and this is the embryological radiological radiological correlation in type 1 you see the red arrow points to the Uh, the spinal cord the yellow arrow points to the stalk which in this case does not contain csf and the this particular arrow shows the cutaneous lesion and that's the intraoperative image which shows the stalk and the cord and that is following sectioning and the postoperative image shows there is more posterior tenting of the cord and an another example likely to be misdiagnosed in this image as a cervical meningocele but whenever there's a posterior tenting of the cord go to the axial t2 image you will find a stalk that is going there and this this is an example of a thoracic lesion once again notice it looks like a routine meningocele and there is a posterior tenting of the cord with the intraspinal syrinx you are not able to see the stalk here neither are you able to see a connection between the intraspinal syrinx and this particular cutaneous lesion but this target sign the presence of a negative shadow within this positive shadow of the sac shows that there is a stalk and lo and behold this is what we find intraoperatively a large thick stalk that goes inside goes outside and let's come to the lumbar ldm which is the mo most common location for an ldm this is a grossly low lying cord going right up to the sacrum and there's an ldm that is going taking off from the posterior aspect to the apex of the 
the sac and there are two tether elongations one is the phylum second is the the ldm now why are ldm tether elongation you just see here the cord is so much pulled uh, posteriorly the shape of the cord is altered to a heart shape and there's a compensatory dilatation at the anterior subarachnoid which shows that these ldms are tether elongations and this is 3d cc image of the same patient showing an intraspinal hydromelia the thickened phylum and that is a stock that contains a blood bulb csf sometimes referred to as a bubble within a bubble that's the intra operative photograph which shows the stock on the coming on the cord coming right up to the sacral region and it can very easily be missed may mistaken for a meningocele just in this particular case my uh, resident was opening up this case just before we, he was operating i just there was only one section in the axis slice where i noticed that there was a stock like connection and uh, what do we find we find a stock inside it is very easy to miss it because the stock will be often adherent to the wall of the sac unless you seek it you will not find it and that's the uh, the phylum that is the cord is adherent way at the uh, below of the sacral region and uh, we have section now in the next you see the sectioned phylum on the section stock and the cord has been adequately untethered that easily this is mis likely to be mistaken for a meningocele there is only one axial section in this patient which showed there was a stock going inside now what will happen if you mistake it for a meningocele you will like get the sac here and excise and this whole cord because the stock is adherent to the cord will become uh, uh, will there be attraction on the cord as the child grows so the child might present at the later age with delayed neurological deficit and that is the reason why this should be recognized and lo and behold we find there's a fairly thick uh, and long fibroblast stock which was sectioned and then the thick taut phylum was also sectioned in this particular patient and this is one of the few patients with uh, lumbar ldms who presented with neurological deficit in our series this child had a, a sphincter disturbance and uh, if you see the axial section some neural structure is going here and this is the intraoperative image which shows not only the degree of traction that uh, that is caused by the ldm not the thickness of the the stock and the vascularity of the stock which has now been detached from the sac and now it is now in section close to the pile surface and once again let me reiterate on all L lumbar ldms is necessary to identify and section the phylum these are the non sacral lesions this child presented only with for evaluation of cutaneous markers and we found just the low lying cord but in one section i found there is a hemicord and there was a small negative shadow going to the right hemicord and we, that's what we found in this interoperative video graph which shows this this is the stock is going through the the dura and you see the stock is adherent to the right side of the hemicord and the reason we were saying we able to see the scm only in one slice is because it is very very tiny scm very it extends only for a few millimeters and this this can occur even in a tj this is a teenage girl who presented with uh, uh, normal neurology for evaluation of the cutaneous markers following a trivial trauma and this is what we found we found a pilar lipoma there's a terminal syrinx low lying cord and there's a non sacral ldm going right up to that and that's the intraoperative the photograph which shows the lipomatous phylum and that is the attachment of the non sacral ldm to the grossly stretched cord which is better seen in this particular image on the thickness of the stock may be variable it may be as thin as a thistle or as thick as my our little finger now what are the differences between ldm and spinal spinal dermal sinus ldms are benign by benign i don't mean it mean that in the uh, in the sense of benign and malignant spinal dermal sinus are dangerous lesion lesions treacherous lesions they can cause separative complications like meningitis epidural abscess subdural empyema intramedullary abscess dermoids etc whereas ldms just cause tethering pathologically spinal dermal sinus have an epithelial lining whereas ldms have deformed neuronal glial elements sometimes even neural fibers embedded in a fibrous trauma we need to remember it there's some controversy about the embryogenesis because we have found on certain other authors from korea have also found that in the same stock closer to the skin we can find features of spinal dermal sinus whereas lower down we can find features of ldm so now we have realized that 
the both because both have a share the same embryological origin when the disjunction occurs incomplete disjunction occurs if the cutaneous sectorum is going to be drawn all the way the down here it ends up as a spinal dermal sinus on the other hand if the neural element is going to be drawn all the way right up to the cutaneous lesion it ends up as an lvm concluding lvms are common lesions and majority of these children are fortunately have uh, no neurological deficit so if we treat them appropriately we leave behind a normal child so let me conclude with this uh, this quote from this uh, film gladiator where the roman general before a major battle tells his soldiers that what we do in life occurs in eternity and uh, needless to say that just like what the uh, roman general says most children with ldm if diagnosed and operated properly will become normal healthy adults often outliving the surgeons who operate on them and that is perhaps the best legacy a surgeon can hope to leave behind thank you for kind attention Thank you, Professor Muthu Kumar. A very beautiful description of a very complex lesion. Uh, is Dr. Deepak ready now? Dr. Deepak, are you ready with your uh, slides? Yeah. I think we'll move with the split cord malformations by Dr. Deepak Gupta. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Let me thank NSI for this opportunity. It's always a trouble for me, and when I speak after ardent speakers like Dr. Sandeep Chatterjee and Dr. Muthu Kumar, anyhow, uh, I'll try to justify my talk. So, uh, split cord malformations, uh, we already know a uh, lot about their embryogenesis. Uh, recently, in fact, uh, way back in 1837, Olivier and subsequently Bruce, uh, they talked about uh, entities called uh, diastomatomalia and diplomalia. However, almost uh, 150 years down the line, Pang. Uh, gave this unified theory of embryogenesis in 1992 wherein he talked about uh, the various uh, pathologies which lead to the development of split cord malformations so in a sense it's due to the persistence of the middle part of the accessory neuroentric canal it's an intermediate segment uh, which uh, makes the notochord and the placoid and uh, it may have some kind of a neurulation abnormalities uh, classically seen in, in the complex split cord malformations by and large uh, as a matter of dictum all over the world people have started accepting this terminology called split cord malformation type 1 and type 2 wherein type 1 is the the kind of abnormality wherein you see two dural sacs separately separated by a extra dural bony or cartilaginous septum in type 2 split cord malformation you see a uh, two hemicords so enclosed in one sac and there may be a fibrous septum uh, dividing the two hemicords and of course uh, your due to the various pathologies of the embryogenesis you may have something called as a compound or a composite type Uh, wherein you may have some uh, split cord malformation abnormalities uh, associated with open neural tube defects in fact we have seen many cases uh, wherein we have operated meningomyelocytes and we explored one level up and we found that these children uh, they had the split cord malformations that's a pictorial representation of the two subtypes that is type 1 wherein you see two hemicords and uh, two hemicords this is right this is left and separated by septum and this is a type 2 wherein you see uh, two hemicords in a single dual septum by and large uh, by and large the management is uh, more of a prophylactic i would say rather than curative in the management of split cord malformations because it has been seen that the, the deficits if they are long standing let's say for more than a year they they are unlikely to reverse by any amount of surgical intervention so conservative management is uh, advised uh, uh, for the type 2 split cord malformations especially more so when they are asymptomatic cases however the the symptomatic type 1 and the type 2 split cord malformations the asymptomatic type 1 in fact this is very debatable i would say because recently there have been few publications from uh, china wherein people have actually talked about uh, not doing any surgical interventions even in type 1 split, split cord malformations and uh, the role of uh, prophylactic detethering and removal of the uh, the type 1 or the type 2 spurs or the septum in the congenital scoliosis also remains quite controversial and debated With, uh, with no, uh, I would say, randomized control study available uh, as of the as of now to answer this question. Well, the 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 aim of the surgery, I would say, is the release of uh, the tethering by the median mesenchymal septum to the hemicords or the and the taking care of the associated lesions in these patients. Uh, it has been established as a cause of tethered cord syndrome, the split cord malformations. and uh, it has also been observed uh, that majority of these children they actually become symptomatic by second decade in fact uh, in our experience in our series published uh, we have noted that 
most of these children uh, they start developing some amount of deficits by three years of age. So we actually advocate early prophylactic surgery in the majority of split core malformations. The progressive deficits, if they are noted in this group of patients, they are they're primarily because of uh, the when the, there is a growth spurt or there is some local injury to the spine or doing some uh, neck flexion or extension in this group of patients. So to talk about uh, how to manage, so basically you need to do extensive uh, neuroimaging. Uh, the role of CT is quite debatable. Uh, majority of the people, uh, they, uh, they don't do it. Somehow, personally, I'm in favor of doing a, a very low dose uh, CT, my, uh, CT study, CT of the, of the, at the level of interest. First, I do a MRI of the entire neurexis, wherein all the co abnormalities can be picked up. Not only just the level of the split, but you also see the any evidence of associated thickened phylum terminal or any phylum lipoma or proximal syrinx and looking at the status of the two hemicores. At times, you may have some kind of syrinx in one of the hemicores, one of the hemicores could be atrophic. So all these abnormalities are picked up very well on the MRI study. And subsequently, the, at the area of interest to define more so the anatomy of the, of the, of the, bone, of the neural arch, uh, CT does help me a lot. In fact, it helps me more so in the, in the surgical decision making because I look specifically at the relationship of the septum to the overlying neural arch, where, which part of the neural arch or the lamina is, it is attached and which part it is free, whether it is an oblique septum or a straight, whether it is thickened at the base or thickened posteriorly. So all these things, finer things are answered uh, very well by the CT scan. This is another patient uh, wherein uh, the, the SAG and the, uh, the axial CTs. And you can see each patient is quite different. The anomalies are very different in each group of patients. So you really need to do spend some time uh, looking at the CT scan of this group of patients. And of course, we have published our data that we, in fact, some of the patients, you do pick up multiple level splits in the same patient. And there comes the importance of screening of the entire neurexis. This was a young girl, I think 13 years of age, who presented to us with the two level. Uh, there was a split at the level of D5 and there was another split at the level of L2. And of course, she had a very thick uh, phylum terminal and uh, a phylum lipoma at L L4. So she underwent surgery for all the three levels in the same sitting. So if you ask me, uh, what are the indications for uh, surgery? Uh, uh, the most, all the children uh, with split core malformations, they should preferably be operated. They should undergo surgery. In fact, way back in nine, uh, the McMaster uh, recommended uh, the prophylactic surgery. I'm getting this thing disturbance on the top. I don't know. Okay. So prophylactic detithering was advised in all children less than six years of age prior to uh, congenital uh, scoliosis correction by McMaster in the series of 250 plus cases. And same was done by Miller also. So there have been a group of people uh, who are still talking about uh, prophylactic detithering in these patients. So by and large, uh, I think conventionally, you should be offering surgical intervention to all children with split cord malformations. All adults who are symptomatic and uh, the adults who are, this is quite debatable, I would say, the adults who have got asymptomatic split cord malformations, but who are involved in physically vigorous lifestyle, they may be offered surgical intervention. Almost 15% of the cases with the congenital scoliosis, they have got uh, uh, split core malformations. Uh, in fact, a few publications have come from China by Feng et al., by Shen et al., and also recently by Yang et al., in fact, which comes to almost uh, 300 plus cases, wherein uh, they have done kind of a comparison in the group of patients wherein uh, bonus per excision was done and not done prior to scoli correction. And uh, they did not find any significant uh, deficit. In fact, they recommended that uh, uh, removal of the bone spur may have some extra added deficit to this group of patients. However, uh, there was a paper published from uh, our Indian data by Dr. N.K. Venkat Ramna uh, and published in 2006, wherein uh, the authors, they in fact, they found that uh, 23 of the 38 split core malformations, uh, they underwent prophylactic surgery and they had good outcome in all of their patients. Once you've decided to operate this group of patients, the, the surgical uh, procedure remains uh, the standard as, uh, as has been enumerated by my previous speakers. The child is placed prone and uh, these are the few uh, uh, kind of uh, small, small things you have to take care of. And uh, I think there's no excuse not to do intraoperative neuromonitoring. You need to have a good intraoperative uh, neuromonitoring team with you, anal sphincter, and other kind of final monitoring should be added to all the children. And uh, the, your, uh, your intraoperative neurophysiologist is a great help to uh, help uh, doing the surgical excisions. 
and i think it's very very important when you when you're doing the kind of uh, uh, work at the caudal part of the split because that is where the cord the two hemicords they join and they're straddling each, each other and there the chances of deficit are highest and that's one place you need to uh, use this intraoperative neuro monitoring uh, very uh, carefully uh, you often need to uh, skin incision has to be it's a median uh, midline vertical skin incision which is two, usually two level up and two level down and the lamina expose is one level up, up and one level down uh, i usually do an extra dural removal of the bony spur in my patients and uh, this is the anatomy exposed usually it is the hypertrophic arch which is gives you a telltale marker of an underlying pathology out here in fact this child had a associated dermoid cyst which can very well be explained by the amerogenetic uh, theory itself this is after removal of the lamina below and above you see the large uh, kind of a, a bony septum uh, dividing the two uh, cords and then the septum is subsequently removed carefully uh, with the uh, nibblers uh, and uh, you know taking care of not to damage the the cord and uh, we try to take out as much of the bony septum extra dually as much as possible subsequently the dura is open the only hitch is that uh, the only trick i would say is that you should open the dura as close to the midline as possible to prevent any stenosis or tightening of the dural canal because you need to have good amount of dura uh, while closing so once you open uh, the dura higher and above you open the dura in the midline just as close to the uh, the septum as possible and subsequently uh, you again dissect out the the peristium from the from the uh, the septum and the dura from the septum and remove the bone intradurally and uh, later on you kind of uh, excise the excess of the the abnormal tithri elements which could be in the form of manium malingus in manke these nugs are actually redundant they don't carry anything and uh, they are mostly sensory so you can very easily get away uh, by uh, taking by knocking them off sometimes uh, you may have uh, deficits intraoperatively after or during the removal so the trick is that uh, you can always uh, put in some warm saline irrigation and leave it there for on 10 to 15 minutes and uh, wait for the neurophysiologist to give you green signal and when the potentials recover then you can continue your work there is no compromise to do a, a meticulous dural closure because uh, the csf leak is a very nagging complication in this group of patients and so the this step is extremely important the the caudal part this is the proximal this is the distal in the caudal part of the type 1c which we have classified when you are removing this part you have to be very very careful in the removal of the spur and intradurally when you go inside you have to excise this uh, the 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 intradural the, the dural additions and the bands between the two hemicords very carefully and this anterior dura usually uh, can either be closed or in fact most of my patients i leave the anterior dura open so that's a very short video i'll quickly run through so that's a young girl who presented to us there's a preoperative ct scan of the girl child we can see the hem hemi vertebra and this is a type 1 split core malformation at the level of l1 that's a detailed mri of the entire neurexis was done so the midline skin incision is being given so carefully you separate this uh, on the paraspinal muscles uh, that's the dermoid uh, in this child and it was there on the <clears throat> on the right side and this dermoid was excised first after this uh, the laminectomy is done both above and below i usually do laminectomy in split core malformations and never a laminotomy uh, in this group of patients so this work has to be quite wide but you don't have to be so wide uh, as in cases of lipoma uh you don't have to go all the way to the pedicel in cases of split core malformations but it should be wide enough to identify the the dura on either side so that's the uh, the external the tissue adherent to the to the uh, posterior hypertrophic neural uh, arch elements which is being removed carefully and you have to be very very careful uh, while handling this because uh the side where it is uh, adherent or attached to the lamina that side uh, should be addressed last because there the movement or the jarring of the underlying cord is maximum so there comes the importance of carefully studying the preoperative ct scan in this uh, group of patients so that's the extra dural uh, septum uh, being removed uh, very carefully you need to spend lot of time in removal of this bony septum and not being in haste 
and uh, usually i do just one case when i'm doing split code malformations it should be done as a first case and you should do it comfortably so i still have not opened the dura now the dura is being opened that's proximal that distal that's right that's left and these are the two hemicodes and then you define again you separate this medial dural septum carefully these are the minor meningocele mankei nerve roots i usually don't have stopped doing intraoperative neuro monitoring for this because these are usually sensory and uh, one need not worry about uh, before division of this uh, abnormal thickened nerve roots but they are the tethering elements there were three nerve such nerve roots which were divided and after separation of this medium dural sleeve you again need to go down deep deep and deep uh, to take out as much of the bone as possible to prevent any regrowth of the spur and uh, careful excision of the medial dural septum is done uh, for a complete uh, detethering i think uh, in the interest of time i'll just show a very quick video the second one um, so in this it's shown a, another technique uh, when you uh, take out the spur at times the spur is very thick and in those cases you may have to drill and uh, i often use a diamond uh, burr in those cases uh, to drill uh, the the inside of the bone but then that's a diamond burr being used uh, with constant irrigation but then you need to be very careful to uh, don't put any cotinoids or anything because that can cause inadvertent injury to the hemicords usually in this group of patients it is the the ventral cord and one hemicord is a kind of a if it is associated with the syrinx that is the cord which can sustain some amount of deficits so you need to be very careful while uh, drilling this uh, uh, thing i would advise not to use any drill uh, in your patients try to take out as much of the bone as possible uh with the rongeurs uh, carefully but this uh, this medial uh, tethering element has to be uh, uh take uh, should be divided completely in this patient actually i did close the anterior dura and uh, subsequently uh, we did we, uh, we do address this uh, uh lower phylum terminal uh, that's the intraoperative uh, neuro uh, the monitoring being done for the phylum that's a, that you can see that there's a very thick phylum being identified and you need to separate all the roots uh, from the phylum carefully and once you are sure that it is non functional then that can be divided i us usually use a series of two liga clips uh for the phylum division uh in this group of patient and then of course my physiologist is helping me out uh at the time of uh, phylum division and that's a closer so that's the child without any deficits so that's a uh, uh, the the type 2 i would say is relatively simple and uh, usually you have this fibrovascular fibro septum inside the inter there could be extra dural band but mostly there is interdural band which is dividing the two hemicords and uh, you can divide it and in fact most of my patients uh, i usually uh, do a uh, phylum detethering also if it is in the same incision even in type 2 split core malformations you can see this patient had a, had a big big phylum lipoma uh, which had to be divided uh, subsequently so we have published our series of almost 250 plus uh, split cord malformations in general of neurosurgery and uh, we are almost 40% of our cases they presented to us uh, uh, with uh, scoliosis with hypo scoliosis and we must remember that th these are the group of patients who are actually asymptomatic i mean at least they don't have any major motor deficits so the child should go back home without any deficits so all your surgical uh, uh, manipulations handling should be to prevent any neurological deficit in this group of children and in this uh, <coughs> we had cutaneous markers in almost 60% of the cases autonomic involvement was noted in 27% of our cases 
and uh, from our series we advised uh, prophylactic uh, detethering and prophylactic removal of the spur in all patients with split cord malformations preferably be below before 3 years of age and that's a new classification which professor ak mahapatra and myself uh, we gave and we noted that some of these patients with there there could be ample amount of uh, space uh, below and above that's a type 1a and that's a type 1b where the, where wherein the spur is straddling the upper part or the, or the cranial part of the bifurcation and the type 1c is in the caudal part and the type d in fact this we have noted more in the younger children or the neonates when which we have noted uh, wherein there is hardly any any room of space and these are the group of patients wherein the chances of neurological deficits are very high uh, while removal of this spur so the, so the pitfall of this surgery in this split cord malformation i would say is that you need to be very very careful about this asymmetric cords and uh, of course uh, there could be one amount one cord with some syringe which could be injured like in this patient you see the left hemicord has got a syringe and this cord can have some amount of injury and then of course type 1d spur if you have in fact you can pick up this type 1d spur very if you do a very careful study of those pre operative ct and mri you may not have ct in very young children but then mri can really help you uh, if the spur is likely to be tight or not so you need to spend good amount of time in looking at the patient's uh, pre operative imaging before venturing uh, these are type 1a there's a type 1b c and that's a type 1d where you see hardly any cord space above and below the bifurcation so one more yeah yeah i'm done so to summarize i would say that all asymptomatic split cord malformation type 1 in children less than 3 to 5 years of age should be operated surgery in symptomatic split cord malformation should be done under intraoperative neuro monitoring only it is highly recommended in the present era prophylactic surgery for type 1 split cord malformation prior to uh, scoliosis correction with detethering especially more so in the right calf is recommended as, as per our institutional practice and uh, it is highly debated to do a uh, prophylactic surgery for asymptomatic type 2 split cord malformations to talk about the role of prophylactic surgery for split cord malformation or detethering in scoliosis is highly debated because we don't have any class 1 evidence as of today i want to thank my teacher uh, professor ak mahapatra who kind of uh, taught me how to handle the spinal cords and whatever i am today in cardiac uh, neurosurgery is all because of him and of course uh, i do have some amount of learning uh distance learning from professor deckling pang who has been a constant source of guidance to me over last two decades thank you so much thank you dr deepak and the uh, intraoperative monitoring is very useful in uh, handling these complex lesions though not done routinely in all the centers i now request dr sohas to speak about intraoperative monitoring thank you <clears throat> am i audible hello yeah 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 dr yeah thank you thank you chaps Yeah, go ahead. And um, now, now we have gone through uh, diff the different the spectrum of pathologies and uh, and the surgical steps and the complications through different different of my senior speakers. I'll go through the classical entity or usage of IUNM in in these surgeries. Most of the pediatric neurosurgeons use IUNM during these these surgeries, although it's well debated. But I'll go I'll go through two different uh, different issues of this. Uh, the use of iunm the basic concepts and the practical application in tether cord most of the most of the neurological complications that occur uh, the neurological complication is around 4 to 10% with uh, transient being around 10 and the permanent being around 4 to 4% so uh, my screen is not moving so you why do you require uh, monitoring in tether cord syndromes the uh, one very important aspect is that uh, anatomy is very distorted they they might be skewed or they may be, they might be much much co more complex than they appear and then most of these children undergo prophylactic surgery at least in 70% and the goal of the surgery is uh, to preserve them at least and at least or give benefit of uh, the surgical efforts or at least you don't want to damage them further so what about the evidence at least there is class 1 or a very strong evidence that it predicts uh, injury to spinal cord weaker evidence that it prevents and reduces neurological injury it has role in prognostication and outcome too so the what are the challenges in uh, doing iunm in children one they are neurologically immature the myelination is ongoing between 1 to 3 years the lumbar uh, 
myelination occurs between one to two years. And so hence the amplitude latency and the current required is much, much different than older, 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 older uh, patients and adults. And the next important challenge is the anesthesia. They're very sensitive to an anesthetics. So they have a more potent and a long lasting effect secondary to uh, usage of uh, especially the halogenate anesthetics. The amplitude and latency are affected in a, in a dose dependent fashion. The next important challenge is they're technically very challenging in terms of parameters, safety, or the possibilities of seizures. And then you, you require a trained and experienced team, a trained neurophysiologist and a trained, trained neuroanesthetist. I'll go through some basics of uh, anesthesia that's used in, these, in, in the IONM when we use IONM for these children. The induction is standard, but beyond the induction, no further neuromuscular block it, uh, blocking drugs are given. The maintenance is using either classical, uh, classically, which is what is described as the TUA, where propofol is added to opioids, or you, you, uh, you use a partial uh, IV anesthetics. We, we use partial, where we use sub-MAC isofluorine. We find it more comfortable. And, uh, and we use um, the BIS monitoring along with it. BIS is an EEG-based algorithm where, you, uh, where it shows the depth of anesthesia during, uh, uh, during the surgery. Along with that, the anesthetist maintains the physiology strictly, and they, they might use axillomyography to look at the depth of anesthesia. So uh, th these are the basic anesthetic drugs, and most of the drugs reduce the amplitude and, uh, and the latency. But what is, important to, uh, what is important to understand is the EMG is not affected by most drugs. I'll just go through the basic setup. These are the, the Cox group, classical Cox screw electrodes, which, which, has, which have low impedance and they do not, uh, are technically do not get displaced during surgery. These are placed in C3, C4, C, uh, front, uh, frontal C, uh, FC4 and FC3. And then you have the um, mono, monopolar electrodes uh, placed between four to six centimeters in the various muscles, quadriceps, gastronomias, tibialis anterior, AH, and the sphincter so the, the most important techniques that are used are the transcranial uh, MEPs, where we use a multiples technique to, uh, uh, with, through the Cochrane electrodes at C12 or C34. And the importance of transcranial, uh, transcranial stimulation is to detect the functional integrity. The other, option, other, possible, other um, techniques are the direct D-wave or the single pulse technique and the SCPs. These two techniques are not used much in uh, tethered cord, at most of, as most of the tethered cords occur low in the spinal cord. Although, although D-waves can be used when you have a tethering at the level of T10-11. Uh, SCPs are not reliable because they require some averaging and there's a lot of fluctuation. And because of the close proximity to the corda, you might, a close proximity of nerves in the corda, you might have a lot of uh, uh, overlaps. And then the other option is the free running EMG or the spontaneous EMG. Again, uh, this, uh, you need to know about this because some, once in a while your electrophysiologist might raise an alarm where, uh, where they pick up a burst or spikes or an acute drop, which again has, uh, is, has high false positivity. It might be due to irrigation cautery or at the same time uh, secondary to injury too. This, this have a low sensitivity and a low specificity. So these are not used classically, but you need to keep watching for them. Then the most important second adjunct is the triggered EMG. This, along with the transcranial MEPs, form the crux of uh, or the cog cogwheel of uh, the whole IONM status. We use a concentric bipolar where the motor roots are elicited by a very th low threshold, about 0.05 to 0.2 milliamps. These are very highly efficacious. But at the same time, it's very important to remember that uh, it does not give a clear warning criteria. Now, this is combined with the mapping where you use the direct stimulation to uh, identify the ventral or the motor, motor, roots, motor roots and identify a classical threshold, which is the lowest current, which is used to stimulate the ventral, ventral roots. Now, anything which is at least two to three times beyond this is considered non-functional. Anything in between might be because of either they are partly functional or because of a nearby root or or maybe uh, an H, uh, H reflex through the dorsal root. So uh, these things have to be dif differentiated, for, differentiated from the classical functional ventral roots. So the key principle is you, you should not sacrifice a rootlet unless you have elicited a normal function elsewhere. This is just to show you the difference between the, in, the transcranial MEP of anal recording and the direct uh, corda icon uh, mapping is releasing the M waves. So you see the difference so the uh, um, but the difference in the function is you the transcranial MAP looks into functional integrity of the cord, whereas the cord mapping looks at the integrity of the neural nerves.
ventral nerves directly. They did not mention, they did not look into the, uh, the direct pathway completely. The next important technique is the bulbocavernous reflex. This is a bit difficult in the smallest children where um, you use uh, the stimulating and the re uh, recording montage on the dorsal penile or the clitoral nerves, which are the stimulating nerves, and the output is from this uh, sphincter anion. Either the wire or uh, needle electrodes are used. A short train of eye stimuli is used. Now, the importance, importance is they show the uh, the bladder circuitry very uh, very definitely. But at the same time, the drawback is it does not have an alert criteria. Hence, a disappearance might mean dyssynergia, but at the same time, you cannot uh, uh, anticipate a disappearance. So this this is one entity, uh, one kind of technique which needs probably needs further of uh, works. Now th these are the different the difference in technique between infants and older children. Everything, most of the things are same except that the transcranial current which we use in infants are usually smaller. This is uh, from our experience, and then the the uh, direct stimulation might require a, a larger current. Again, uh, from our experience too. Now, uh, just to go through the uh, technique and the alerts, uh, when we start off. Post the anesthesia, we uh, acquire a robust baseline uh, uh, recording after after the reversal, or uh, and then beyond that, every ten minutes uh, the transcranial MEP is acquired, and then during the critical periods, probably more often, and according to the surgeon's needs. The alerts are: you have a change in response, change in amplitude, and change of waveform or th change in threshold. All these are at least ninety to hundred percent sensitive, uh, with a ninety to hundred percent negative predictive value. The significant alert criteria are they are uh, a significant alert is isolated, it is consistent, and it is disproportionate to the baseline. Now, now these three, three, uh, all these three factors have to be um, ensured in each significant alert. Now, what do you, what, uh, how do, how do we uh, have? We have a checklist for uh, taking decisions. So, once an alert is sounded, you stop the uh, stop ev the surgical maneuvers, including irrigation. Everything is brought to standstill, and then the following questions are asked for: Is it localized or systemic? Is the depth of anesthesia within the predecided criterion that we look for the best in older children, younger children? We look for the controls. Uh, what is the MEP? I'm oh, sorry, and the mean arterial pressure. I, I meant, and uh, is it normotensive? If not, build up the pressure. What is the no uh, body temperature? Is it normothermic? You should remember that you are the, you are operating on the smallest kids, and they might go into hypothermia very easily. And then, uh, is the event remains on repeated stimuli, arbitrarily done after ten minutes? So what do you, how do you respond to uh, the alert? You you have you immediately pause the surgical process. You um, uh, uh, communicate with the senior anesthetist and the senior neuro neurophysiologist immediately. And beyond that, you uh, you check the anesthetic anesthetic parameters along with the anesthetist, of course. Um, you uh, through the either the, the BIS and the accelerometry might contribute to this uh, information. And then you might uh, you might ask them to switch to a uh, complete tube protocol. I usually start off uh, because I have a partial uh, partial IVM uh, anesthetic protocol. I switch from ISO to CO and give it a try, and then go for tube if necessary. I had only few very few occasions where I had to use um, tube directly. Uh, you optimize the MAP, where if uh, at, make it at least uh, 10 to 15 percent over the over the, uh, pre, uh, the immediate arterial pressures, and then optimize the hematocrit, have a low threshold for uh, transfusion, optimize the blood pH and uh, PCO2, seek normothermia. The next is the technical and the neurophysiological issue, rule out technical issues, and that is of course the, uh, the neurophysiologist would do it. You look at the pattern and the timing of the alert, this uh, and of course as you have as as I mentioned in the beginning, you have already stopped it. You irrigate with warm saline. You re revisit the surgical steps. Look at the local anatomy. You might go back to the imaging to see what uh, uh, what what are the possibilities. Um, uh, the local anatomy and the surgical steps are probably key to the surgical uh, inputs. Now, um, uh, mind you, the, again, it's a case by case approach. Now, all these steps are not mutually exclusive. They are ne nearly simultaneous uh, uh, among the team, team members. Now, after that, what you do, you repeat the in incremental stimuli. If there is no improvement, you abandon manipulation of that vicinity and probably stop the surgery if necessary. Uh, once in a while, I have considered methylprednisone, especially some situations like, like let's say, split cord, um, uh, may, be, uh, may be controversial, but uh, may have a role too. I'll go through some specific scenarios, uh, some where we use specific techniques. This is a lipomatous phylum. The technique is direct stimulation or the triggered, triggered EMG. You identify the threshold. You you pick it. Uh, you raise raise the threshold. Raise, raise the uh, stimulating current to at least three times and see uh, non uh, demonstrate non-functionality. And uh, if it's non-functional, you cut it. Uh, 
if it is showing any sum function, some one of the one of the fine ANA nerves or S two three four nerves might be uh, clinging to it. So you have to isolate it very clearly uh, using patties. The CSF has to be separated, and then you stimulate. We use a concentric bipolar. If you notice. The terminal lipo is gently similar to uh, similar to the same technique, but um, uh, along with the threshold, you look at uh, you identify the uh, interface interface of the anatomical interface and the electrical interface, and then this is the this is the normal cord inter, uh, chain trans transitional into 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 the fatty component, and then you section it after stimulating it, and along with that with constant uh, constant transcranial MEP monitoring. The split cord malformation, as Dr. Deepak elucidated, you use um, monitoring. Usually, the technique is transcranial MAP and direct stimulation. Direct stimulation, when you have its fibrous tract, you stimulate it directly to uh, demonstrate non-functionality. And you need to have you need to have transcranial MAPs because you don't want to have a, any kind of inadvertent injury progressing by not not picking it up at the appropriate time. If you pick it up, you slow down the surgery, stop, and may even postpone or delay the next step. As much as possible, so that is that is for split cord. In myelocystocytes, you identify the edges of the placard. You might identify dysfunctional nerves using transcranial MPs and direct stimulation. And lipomyelomyelitis seals are classical situations where corda, corda mapping is used. These are the peripheral nerves. This is the dorsal, um, dorsal lipoma with the dorsal component of the fat and the peripheral nerves. You uh, try to identify the threshold and look for look for non-functional nerves, non-functional uh, non-functional attachments, and disconnect them. Anything in between. In the threshold and the non uh, the non functional three times uh, higher threshold can be either partly functional nerves or uh, or any nerves which are clinging to it or any or a dorsal reflex dorsal edge reflex now the the most and the most important aspect is suppose if you don't do not identify a normal component of the same stimulation you do not uh, section it uh, section that particular uh, tag or uh, attachment so again, the same uh, being revised, the cord icona mapping. The, the, so the key principle is not to sacrifice a rootlet unless you have elicited a normal function elsewhere. So this is uh, another classical situation where the left sphincter is uh, left sphincter is absent and, uh, and left sphincter was absent in the beginning, and then you have a direct stimulation. You have the right AH and the right sphincter. Left uh, left AH and left GA. Left sphincter is absent. Right uh, left gastrocnemius is present. Left tibial anterior is present. Everything is present except the left sphincter, and that remains uh, absent towards the end. So that is uh, part of uh, the codec ma mapping. So in, when you have a re or a myelomyelin seal, the direct stimulation comes to play, where you stimulate the fibrous attachment or the uh, non-caudal attachment. The dermal sinus has the same technique, that you directly stimulate the fibrous attachment. Uh, trying to analyze some a particular scenario, you have an eight, this is an, a situation of an eight-month in, uh, infant with a bulge on the back, with a left foot de a deficit and a neurogenic bowel and bladder. So this is this is the baseline. You look, you look at the um, the low AH is absent. The sphincter is, left sphincter is absent. Right so right sphincter and left AH is absent. You you wait for it. Uh, you see that the upper limbs are much different from the low, lower limbs. Upper limbs are much different from the lower limbs. So you change. Uh, I change the anesthetic, anesthetic agent to uh, from 0.8 of ISO to 0.3 MAC of ISO, which is uh, and then the lower limbs are uh, changed from uh, from 100 uh, from 10 to 100, a uh, 10 times change, whereas the upper limb remained at 150. So just a change of and the sphincter improved. Just a change of anesthetics and and the parameters are different. When you have a different parameters, you can very well mon monitor them in a better way. You have a sphincter which is monitorable now compared to a non-monitorable uh, sphincter in the beginning. The next, uh, so that that's the sphincter which was absent and which appeared later without uh, without surgical manipulation. Now this is again, and the, the direct stimulation, there are significant, uh, towards the end, there's a significant improvement of the lower limb muscles. This is post dg thing. More scenarios, this uh, this was 10 year old who had uh, incontinence, who had incontinence and um, uh, incontinence and difficulty to get up from a squatting position. So she, she had a, a inner sphincter present in the beginning of the surgery, but towards the end, I lost it. Uh, there's uh, some time, uh, so I lost it. So, so I'm going to conclude quickly. Yeah. Yeah, we are coming to it. So um, this is another situation where the sphincter appeared up to, towards the end of surgery. Again, um, um, 
So many things, uh, when you have a baseline monitorability, you, it reflects the baseline physiology. physiology. When you have a non-monitorable function, they are uh, probably reflect the poor, they reflect poor prognosis and fix the deficits. The intra event might uh, reflect reflect uh, a post-op deficit. A preserved baseline in IONM ensures that it has an intact post-op uh, status. Uh, you need to be aware of these complications, needle stick injury, seizures, burns, tongue bite, which is very prone. Uh, so you need to have a, uh, you need to have a proper tongue blocks and there might be airway compromise too. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Just completing. Just two, two, two more slides. A detailed clinical examination is very complementary. This has to be remembered by uh, you. Need to examine your patient before the surgery in detail because the IONM is an adjunct but not the primary. So the, and the limitations are the monitoring of bladder and bowel functions are very limited, especially very young children. Expertise is key. To conclude, to conclude, a team approach is very key. You need to have an anesthetist and physiologist whom you understand and whom we can keep co communicating and collaborating regularly. And then you can create a consistent protocol within your team, which is which is probably uh, which is well understood by your uh, uh, team. Uh, so INM is a very good uh, micro uh, is a very good adjunct along with good microsurgical technique. Thank you. Thank you, Sas, for a very comprehensive talk. Uh, you would have realized by now tethered cord encompasses a variety of complex pathologies. The surgical techniques differ from each of these pathologies. Nevertheless, the goal is to have the complete untethering. And uh, in the long term follow up, we must to follow up and see that retethering doesn't occur so that the children do not deteriorate at a later stage. So I now request uh, Dr. Suchanda to speak about the basic surgical principles of retethering as well as prevention of. Retethering. Just a moment, why is not sharing? Can you see my screen? Navneet? Can you see me? Yeah, you are seen, but you are not, slides are not seen. Yeah, that's what it's not coming. Is going to. Uh... Navneet, are you there? Yes, sir. Can you just help out, uh, Doctor Suchan? Uh, the PowerPoint has been open. Has to be opened first and then shared. I shared it. Can you see it now? No, 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 no. But it is. Uh... Desktop screen is not coming. You you open your presentation first on the that. yeah and then okay. share with me. yeah. I've done that. Chanda, you probably need to sign out and sign in again. I had the same issue, and uh, then I signed out of Zoom and Z signed in, and I could do it. If you are the host, you should be able to do it. Okay, I think it will come now. You see now? Yeah. Yeah, now it's there. Yes. Okay. Go Sorry. The for the yeah. Go straight in. Uh, thank you, NSI webinar committee and Professor Venkat Ramana sir for giving me this opportunity among these prolific speakers. And what all these uh, talks and what they don't want is retethering. And this is what I'm supposed to talk about. So this is a small, this is an example of how a tethered cord looks. Dr. Venkatramana has uh, told about it. And this is a case of a, a retethered case, a dorsal retethering case, which is the commonest one. And you can also see sometimes, most of the times, or many times they're associated with a terminal syrinx. And this is a case of ventral retethering, not very common, but still you can see the ventral retethering after a split cord malformation, this is the post-op scan, which of course is not my case, I've taken from the one of the publications. So I'll just go through this case presentation. This is a four-year boy who presented with the constipation, abdominal pain, and low back pain, leg pain managed with laxatives. MRI showed tethered cord with fetifilum, was operated, symptoms for asymptomatic for six months. Then again, had onset of leg weakness. MRI showed lipoma disconnected and phylum terminal released. Surgeon refused to explore. So the second opinion and another surgeon offered re-exploration interoperatively. They found various nerve roots were adherent to the dorsal dura mater. Intradural neurolysis was done, post-op improved and asymptomatic for 20 months. 
again after that he again had the same position this time with fecal incontinence and foot pain mri showed unnatural position of fatty phylum which was in opposition with the dorsal direct right angle surgical re exploration was done again found to have not to the phylum adhesions with were arachnoidal and nerve root could be completely dissected and it improved for four eight months now you see again he develops a fecal incontinence and now he's school going to in class uh, two and so much of social embarrassment and he developed behavioral changes i was explored and now up to l1 and fatty phylum was further section nerve root were wrapped around the lipoma stump and they were seen traveling at right angles and kinking and as shaped down which were again meticulously uh, removed and uh, dissected under intraoperative monitoring and was put on long course of anti inflammatory and subsequently for one year he did not so this case, case history explains the complexity of retethering so why does it happen how does it happen what should be done so that it doesn't happen i am told to speak about surgical principles so i'll remove this so i'll discuss about why it should not happen Incidence is not low actually when surveillance is adequate and it is a progressive nature. Un re untethering is much more difficult task than the primary untethering because you require uh, the difficulty factor remains uh, the considerable surgical acumen and skill are necessary to avoid neural injury to deal with post operative and also the incidence of post operative complications are a little bit more in case of uh, re tethering surgery. so that it is a time dependent event as i told you and meta analysis of 608 patients as reported by goodrick et al in uh, 2016 showed that there is an incidence of about 3.2% per year and uh, uh 0% is seen at 2.1 years and around 57% at 18 years tethering usually occurs at the more caudal segment of the cord in association with the low lying conus so post where when does it occur if you look briefly post most common in pediatric cases in myelomeningocele 75% but symptomatic is only good thing is 30 10 to 30% and 15% also in adult recurrent tethered cord post repair of lipomyelomeningocele symptomatic is 5 to 20 to 5 to 10% and dr sandeep also said in his series it's around 5% the other causes are very rare in kids but there are the commoner causes for the adult rtc in patients who need the uh, operation for both retethering and spinal correction concurrent operation has been shown to show a lower retethering rate than two stage operation we should know this so try to do both together is what they advocate from this study clinical features time of manifestation usually 6 to 7 years after operation the whole growing period up to 18 years of age seems to be vulnerable time for retethering the clinical features mostly remains the same as that of cord back pain motor deficit or bone uh, lower like again lower extremity weakness or gait disturbance muscular problems urological function worsening and sensory deficits clinical features one thing we need to know to the neurological examination is very important for differentiating it from tethering from any other thing if the muscle power is decreased or the direction of deformity is changed retethering is Uh, to be suspected symptoms of a tight phylum terminally may also manifest in children with a normal positioned conus phylum terminal retethering retethering very rare and the possible causes are a young age with more growth a lower conus might be predisposed to more tension developing in the cut phylum 8.6 in one series and a recent study showed a 5.2% of uh, increase what are the radiology to diagnose we have mri which is the most um, most friendly i mean investigation to use and of the region of interest mostly the lumbosacral or screening the whole spine detect possible uh, association lesion associated lesions like sphingomyelia or diamonds brain of course in case of mmc where you could diagnose a shunt malfunction assessment of scoliosis or other bony malformation is also required a prone position mri has been advocated advocated the prone position mri uh, where you can detect in a phase contrast ct in a phase contrast sequence where the ventral motion of the uh, spinal cord is not there but these are very technically demanding from the technician point of view and requires more time usually not done but then it has been shown to be beneficial because you can see that there is no movement left 
and then CSF analysis, this is a, case, this is a study from Ames. Uh, and so I put it that they have found that in such cases of retargeting, they have found increased concentration of lactate acetate or alanine, which has been reflected in MR spectroscopy as well. It was uh, re uh, reported from Ames in India. Eurodynamic study of very important. Whenever you suspect avoiding this dysfunction, you should do it because then you can detect the subclinical changes of urological dysfunction, and you can this can lead to early diagnosis of retarded cot syndrome prior to having a clinical manifestation. Ultrasonography has been described by some where you can see because because this of the skin defect you see you can go and reach and you can see there is no movement of that particular region. So what are the surgical principles? Surgical antithering is primarily, otherwise it's moving by itself. Surgical uh, antithering is primarily aimed at preventing further neurological deterioration may allow for functional improvement. Let's look at it. Deterring is carried out cautiously with desired electrophysiological intraoperative monitoring. Suhas has already told how it is so important. Surgery and shows improvement of stability of the clinical features in 80%, 70 to 80% of the cases, and in 20 to 30%, it stabilizes. Complete circumferential detethering is the meticulously is the aim for preventing uh, again uh, tethering. So ventral tethering, though there are less number of cases, yet this has been described usually in split cord mal uh, malformations where you can see the important things what you need to remember in this case is that you have to approach from one side of the hemicord, lift it up and then detether the ventral tethering. Never to go in between the two hemicords. The reasons are tight adhesion bands and then you'll have an end on view of the ventral septum, which will be difficult. And the operator may find himself entangled within the two sleeves of a septum and the uh, also, there could be the anterior spinal artery, which could be damaged, and also deep within the cleft may inflict a thermal injury to the hemicos. So this is very important. You need to know. You should not go in from between the this one uh, between the two hemicos, rather from one side. And only condition where you can go from between is if you have an associated neuroenteric cyst or teratoma, teratoma buried under the cleft. So how intramonitoring helps? So as I already said, endpoint of safe untethering can be decided based on intraoperative neurophysiological findings, more aggressive dissection and untethering possibly in the electrophysiological silent areas and the absence of identifiable functional tissue gives the primary surgeon confident to aggressively dissect and untether areas infiltrated with the deep uh, dense scar. So what are the cons? Selection and placement of electrodes is of paramount importance. And for that, a thorough neurological examination is required as to which muscles needs to be uh, put, the needle needs to be put. Passive EMG monitoring for stretch-induced discharges has limited sensitivity. And uh, so, you know, you have to play up with the uh, stimulation parameters. During surgery, probably one thing is that it may increase the operative and the anesthetic times, but however, the benefits are more important than the this one, risk. So surgery is the only treatment modality for this surgical damage to neural tissue is not negligible during re untethering A careful balance of risk and benefit is therefore necessary. It depends on the individual patient, the type of previous surgery, and the experience of the management team. Severe scarring is the most troublesome factor here. Neurological complication rate of more than 10% has been noted when already there is a urological symptom. And the aim in so thus those cases remains to protect the renal function. So what are the other surgical techniques which help? I mean, these are in fact uh, implied in multiple tethering cases, like a spinal cord shortening, where you do where you don't approach the neural tissue at all. You go to the bone and you do uh, you do you shorten the bone by doing a posterior vertebral column subtraction osteotomy. Just care for thorough at L1 level usually. The pros are it avoids the risk to neural injury and scar formation caused by direct manipulation of the neural structure and CSF-related complications. And the cons are it leads to growth retardation or crankshaft deformity. Not very popular, but yes, this is a newer technique, though it was first described way back in 1997 in Japan. But now, again, a lot of papers are coming out with this. So other surgical techniques remains in case of a functionless limbs, in case of myelomeningocele paraplegia or recurrent retractory, you can section the entire cord at the functionless level. And uh, that is one of the modalities practiced. 
So complications could be CSF leak, pseudomeningocele wound dehiscence. These are a little more common because you are dealing with uh, ischemic uh, tissue over there. So it is there. So now let's come to prevention. How do you prevent them? Reduction of the cord's dural sac ratio is proposed by Pang. Sectioning of the normal spinal cord, I have already told. Retention sutures that traverse the intradural space between the cord. The, I'll just show you because they have put retention sutures all over the area where pia is deficient and they have shown that 0% retethering at an 8-year follow-up in the 20 cases they have done by Tubbs and O. So this is the picture I would like to show. Uh, here you can see this is the cord, this is the dura. They've taken these sutures at three centimeter differences and also they have sutures transversely here, here, here at three centimeter distance so that the cord doesn't cup and come in uh, connection with the dorsal dura. And these sutures, you know, you have to take care that you take only the outer layer of the dura, not the inner layer, because in that way you can promote more CSF leak. So you take the partial dural, you know, stitch and give retention sutures and and then here inside also you do some uh, sutures horizontal like this and here you put a dural graft of your choice okay sorry so frequent other modalities are frequent uh, turning of the patient post frequent turning of the patient post operatively early mobilization of to prevent gravitational forces to allow contact between dura and the stump, synthetic dural grafts to expand the dorsal dura, uh, dura dorsal to the cord, duroplasty with autologous thoracolumbar fascia, which is the most commonest thing practice, and creation of a large CSF space behind the spinal cord, use of sutures in between the ventral pia and the ventral dura. Tenting and laminoplasty has also been practiced by many. So, what are the graft material which are used? Gore-Tex is one. Preclude is one, surgical cell, durogen, elastic, mat board, xenografts. These are various case reports I, I saw in the literature that many people have used all these things. But then the commonest one is here, the autologous thoracolumbar fascia, followed by next is Gore-Tex. For eight years follow-up in uh, around, in few cases, they have found that there was no additions when the Gore-Tex was, uh, was, was placed between the um, uh, cord dorsal surface and the dura. Preclude is again another one which used uh, uh, that and it is reported that it has two surfaces, one side which prevents adhesion, other side which promotes adhesion. So you put the one which doesn't uh, uh, lead to adhesion inside and the other side outside. So there is a seal as well as there is a barrier between the this one. So this is used in the ventral dura actually, whenever you want to put a ventral uh, barrier. So most of the time preclude has been used. Surgery cell and all has been used. Durogen is again a good material and we have also used in many cases and uh, shows minimal inflammatory changes. Surgery cell again has uh, its own disadvantage as well as elastic, which was very popular in the 1980s and 90s. So we had a small series, it's a part of a thesis going and now we have collected 65 prospectively and we have found in that 13 cases were retail had. But our average of surgery they reported to us quite later, not six to seven years, it's around 15 years. And this were the cases we operated in the last few years. Uh, I think it was three years and uh, we're ongoing this study and, um, and this is what it is. We will be coming out later with this particular series. And uh, if you look at the published series of surgical outcome of retethered cord, which has been operated, I mean, untethering of retethered cord. And in 77 cases, they found stabilized in 84 and improved in 24 and 16% deteriorated. Herman et al, 153 cases. Again, they showed improvement in motor pain, very good, 90% and even bladder up to 35%. And uh, you know, woman at all, again, 77% improvement, 26% stabilized. Meta at all, 17% improved, 76% stabilized. Hi, she at all. We only discussed about the urological findings, findings and they found 80% of bladder symptoms improved. So with this, I will conclude. And in conclusion, I would like to say that uh, retethering is not so uncommon. It is a difficult and irritating thing to deal with. Need to be watchful in follow-ups to diagnose. Treatment of symptomatic retethering is only surgery. Results are good with good circumferential unretethering, a good clinical equipment to pick up, and a good surgical skill to patiently dissect is required. Intraoperative monitoring is beneficial. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sukhinda. I think uh, I thank all the faculty for giving wonderful talks. 
uh, the important step in uh, uh, surgical technique is to have the significant uh, care while doing the surgery. <laughs> surgical experience is very, very important in dealing with these lesions. If you're not experienced, I think we should avoid operating. And the topic is open for a discussion now. One technical point to Dr. Deepak Gupta. I think the while removing the bone is per, I think the bone cue size sometimes is very useful. Uh, instead of the diamond drill nowadays, I switched over to bone cue size. Yeah. So it is uh, very gentle and you know you have a very good control. Yeah. I have also used in, I think, a couple of cases, but uh, over passing years, I'm now, now becoming more and more comfortable with the gentle use of uh, rongers. I agree. I mean, I mean, this is only an additional point for the youngsters. It is a little safer. Yeah. So, uh, any other questions? I think most of the questions have been answered in the chat box, and uh, some more are there. We will continue to reply there with the questions on the chat box. And uh, Dr. Dev Pujari, you want to say something? I think uh, most of the things uh, have been said. Uh, the a uh, couple of questions on uh, monitoring, I think probably if uh, Suhas wants to answer. And uh, there was a question of associated syrinx, which I think uh, most of us find that uh, this is most likely a dysplastic syrinx, which disappears after uh, a few months after uh, untethering of the cord. Uh, so I think th these were the main features. Probably Mutukumar has. Uh, was trying to answer that when I saw the chat box last. I, I too have answered that. We yeah. need to I think <coughs> most of the syringes which we call as terminal syringes, that are syringe, syringes that are I think uh, one important question uh, which has been answered on chat box but probably worth talking about is uh, when do we actually operate? And uh, I think uh, uh, Sandeep has also talked about uh, yesterday that uh, his threshold is about three months for lipoma. I usually operate around six months and I think uh, if anybody has uh, any opinions on that, you can... Yeah, there is another question in the chat box which mm -hmm. talks about the timing of surgery for spinal dermal sinus. Spinal dermal sinus is a tricky situation because ah. spinal dermal sinus, because it's not the same as a split cord malformation or lipoma. Because while waiting for the child to grow up and put on white, what if the child develops a separate complication? So spinal dermal sinus... If your anesthetic team is good enough, I think uh, I would prefer to operate a little earlier, a little more aggressive for uh, as far as timing of surgery is concerned for spinal dermal sinus than for other lesions. Because you can never say for years together it can remain asymptomatic or within 15 days later that I've seen that happening and uh, that uh, child has remained paraplegic for the rest of the life and uh, it is it's a very disheartening thing to see. One other thing which uh, uh, did not uh, come out very clearly in Suchanda's talk is that, uh, you know, Paul Steinbock emphasized uh, when uh, he has been coming and I think he's written a paper on it and uh, most other people have written about it. Whenever a child has come with a symptom of retethering and if the child already has a pre-existing shunt, the child had hydrocephalus and was shunted, you should make sure that the shunt is working before you work him up for retethering. So sometimes uh, the uh, signs of spinal cord dysfunction can get exacerbated even in something as simple as a malfunctioning shunt. Yeah, yeah but... so that's why I was, uh, I said that when you do an MRI, you have to do an MRI of the brain. So right. that you see that the shunt malfunctions are not there. I could not emphasize that because I wanted to. Yeah, to talk about this uh, dermal sinus, uh, I fully agree with Dr. Muthu Kumar uh, because I think in 2004, we have reported a case of a young child uh, with a dermal sinus presenting with CSF leak and meningitis in periodic neurosurgery. And that child, after we treated an, um, with antibiotics, uh, we, we addressed the spinal dermal sinus very early. Yes. So this complication can happen in these children. Uh, and so they, uh, they deserve to be operated much earlier than the rest of the other children. One more thing about shunt and uh, spinal dysgraphism is that if a child with tethered cord has already undergone uh, shunting for, uh, for an associated hydrocephalus, one of the um, one of the ways a shunt dysfunction can present in these children 
is a worsening scoliosis. Actually, a worsening scoliosis also, if the scoliosis worsens also, one has to look for shunt dysfunction because uh, there I have seen certain patients with the shunt dysfunction where the, the decomposition has occurred by the syringe cells with the communicating with the fourth one. So that is one of the reasons. So shunt dysfunction can also lead to not the classical shunt malform malfunction, but also can lead to worsening of the scoliosis, pre-existing scoliosis, or probably development of even fresh scoliosis. One question which I might want to ask is uh, that if you are observing a patient for whatever reason, uh, do you do you reimage them for seeing something like uh, increase in uh, syrinx, or uh, is is there any way of following up patients who are either awaiting surgery or where you have decided to observe? That is, I don't think there is any class one evidence to give, give us any guidelines in this particular issue. So what I tend to do is, uh, if the child is otherwise even otherwise neurologically normal, at least I reimage once in six months, minimum six months, because what my contention is that. Uh, there's no point in waiting for the child to deteriorate and then find a, uh, for, find a new finding in the MRI. So that particular neurological deterioration may or may not improve after intervention. So we have to be a little more aggressive in our surveillance imaging because I have seen this happening. So I have followed up certain patients by, and the patients suddenly they stop coming and two years later they come with a profound neurological deficit and I find a big syrinx and uh, by the time it is too late, even if you intervene, the, the neurological function is not going to come back. So, uh, I mean, it's relatively safe. So, at least six months. Six months is a reasonable alternative. And if after two or three MRIs, if they are still not worsening, you can increase the duration in the interval. Surveillance in the interval can be increased. Uh, I also follow the same uh, regime, six months to do an MRI. And uh, every three months, I follow them up with the clin clinical examination. Earlier, if there is any deterioration, of course, we re-image and take them for surgery. Is there any point in uh, following up with electrophysiology, Suhas, Deepak? It's difficult, practically, to do it electrophysiology in a uh, awake child. So that's an issue. But uh, maybe uh, ultrasound, use of ultrasounds and probably uh, urodynamics in older children can help. So if you have a, a new appearing uh, post void residue which was not there earlier, you might pick up uh, early uh, neurogenic uh, bladder, maybe. Yeah, UDS is the only thing which I usually do in my practice uh, at three months uh, post-operatively and uh, subsequently if required. The electrophysiology, the standardization keeps changing at different ages and there is so much of subjective variation. It's very difficult to interpret. I think urodynamics is reasonably reliable if you think uh, even in the non-neurogenic neurogenic bladder or occult TCS. I don't the think any other yeah. electrophysiology is yeah. The electrophysiology in, in an in awake, awake person, they use surface electrodes and the, these surface electrodes have lots of impedance. So the, the I mean, and the, uh, along with this de the myelination issue, plus the surface impedance adds to uh, uh, zero output in INM. So in TROP, we use int I mean, directly pierce, I mean, needles. So needles are different. That cannot be used when a child is awake. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Maybe some early, early lumbar potentials, uh, Sohas, among all the things, early lumbar potentials, they suggest yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, um, um, we have, uh, I mean, I have been uh, uh, using uh, ion, I mean, all children, yeah. and I have got it at least uh, till three months of age. And uh, even earlier than three months, direct stimulation is very useful. Direct yeah. stimulation can still can be used with a high current can still be used in even younger children. So even at one month, I have tried direct stimulation and that, that uh, it does contribute during surgery. Yeah. Although transcranial yeah. is not possible. Yeah. Like Suchanda for the uh, duroplasty, uh, you have, you must have reviewed the literature. What is the difference between uh, the uh, autologous natural material versus the synthetic material? Is there any difference in the incidence of retethering? So literature, I mean, obviously most of the people are using this uh, thoracolumbar fascia, but many times they are scarred. So they have shown a good promising result with Gore-Tex. That's what eight years, nine years uh, follow-up is there. But they are all anecdotal reported cases, what I have seen, not like a big series where they have used consistently. And they have shown that this uh, material has uh, actually stood the test of time. They all have some uh, inflammatory changes coming up. So there, there was a very bad report about preclude and uh, core takes by Rekade. 
afterwards after a, a considerable amount of use so i think uh, probably not to use artificial material is uh, the and uh, another another which they have used i mean dr walker group has uh, given a human amniotic membrane that was the latest which was reported in 2018 and he have done in three cases and of course it's 220 so we don't know so, i mean that was said that i think gortex is a very i have stopped using gortex because gortex is associated with a high incidence of csf leak mainly because many synthetic material for example in gortex if you take a stitch unlike a biological yes. tissue where if the needle size is larger than the suture size because the suture is crimped into the needle in a biological tissue because of the elasticity the hole gets closed whereas in a gortex the hole remains so there is a special suture for the gortex which is 10 times costlier than a proline or a rubin silk which are using so that is that is a larger diameter than the needle distally so unless you use that you are going to end up with a big cs of collection so i, I have given up all sorts of uh, um, artificial material i have gone back to thoracolumbar fascia yeah. so you don't I need to take any if the fascia is available only the question arises when the fascia is not available yeah. I, whenever i use artificial material i have tried fibrin glue it doesn't work sometimes i am putting back a little bit of fat on the uh, uh, area which will hold it uh, to some extent but still it is not 100% full proof So any experience on duragen i mean we have very small one or two cases we have used it but uh, i don't know i mean not a long term follow up so can't say. anyone has used duragen i I have, i have used but uh, long term i still don't have any follow up even the bovine, been... even the bovine pericardium is also very good i have used it specifically in cases of my lipoma and uh, i must have done more than i think uh, 12 cases probably and uh, my experience has been fantastic no complication here as yet in any of the cases and it's very uh, easy to handle bovine pericardium is bovine pericardium is very easy to handle uh, deepak it's what good. is the suture material you use for bovine pericardium and uh, does it create the same problem which i told you like in gortex okay. it does not i, I always uh, take five more five more of more with elastic uh, than pericardium i reinforce with the glue uh, no 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 repeat again there are some more lab repeat again so so bovine pericardium i use a standard fibro monofilament suture uh, for the closer i use continuous continuous i don't interlock my sutures when i'm doing with the bovine pericardium and sometimes uh, if i am in doubt i do reinforce my bovine pericardium with the fibrin glue also tissue glue but however it is usually not required you know i do all this uh, kind of uh, valsalva maneuver at the end and if i'm satisfied uh, i really don't uh, use uh, tissue glue also and the handling is very good of the bovine pericardium doctor ek purohit just uh, yeah. uh, yes sent a message that uh, tinting the dura whenever you use artificial material uh, will uh, after the duroplasty will prevent retethering thanks so chinda any opinion uh, yeah, yeah, we used to do that and i have mentioned that actually if you said uh, do i went through the slide that mentioned this especially with the a presence of the mri and lot of uh, people parents do come with the uh, various kinds of symptoms and various kind of uh, abnormalities detected uh, by the radiologists as well as the pediatricians and we need to find right answers for this right kind of anomalies and right timing to operate and the right technique is very very important to make sure that we detether the spinal cord completely allow the child to grow normally without developing any neurological deficits but all these children require follow up depending upon the type of pathology and that need to be emphasized to the parents and whenever there is a neural dysgenesis it is important to counsel the parents that the neurological deficit may persist or even sometimes worsen in future i think that's very important to emphasize that fact and uh, what we can uh, need to tell or uh, create awareness among radiologists is that after a complete uh, detethering this spinal cord will not ascend up 
to the adult level or normal level. So sometimes while reporting, uh, medical legal is very important that they still write that the uh, tethering is still persisting and that need to be created uh, among the radiologists. Good awareness is important. So with this, I thank uh, each one of you uh, personally and thank the audience and thank NSI for giving me this uh, opportunity. Dr. Dev Pujari, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye, guys. Next uh, month, we meet with a webinar on solitary metastasis, uh, and it will be moderated by uh, Professor VP Singh. Okay. See fine. you then. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye. Thank you, Navneet, for uh, hosting this meeting. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So how many uh, attended finally? Sir, the count was around 145 people. Okay. With some people including on YouTube. Oh, that's good. Sir. Thank you so much.